In Acts chapter 19, we find the experience of Paul as he arrives to do his missionary work in Ephesus. Ephesus was a very major city in the city of Asia Minor. It was the capital and it was its commercial center during the time of the Roman Empire. In Acts chapter 19 verse 1 it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. When Paul arrived in Ephesus, that great center, and by the way, keep in mind that when Paul went to do his evangelistic work, he chose strategic places. He did not just choose any place. He looked at ways that will best be able to spread the gospel. So if he took a commercial center, if he took the capital city like Ephesus of Asia Minor, what would happen is that from that capital, the message would easily be able to go to the rest of that province. Well, God was preparing for the work in Ephesus. It says there when Paul arrived in Ephesus, he found certain disciples. Now, who were these disciples? Let's look at verses 2, 3, and 4. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. And verse 4, Then Paul said, Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him that should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. During the time of the Jewish festivals, Passover and others, many people gathered around in Jerusalem for those special events. It was during that time we read in Acts of the Apostles 281 to 282 it says, The Jews now widely dispersed in all civilized lands were generally expecting the advent of the Messiah. When John the Baptist was preaching, many in their visits to Jerusalem at the annual feast had gone to the banks of the Jordan to listen to him. There they had heard Jesus proclaimed as the promised one and they had carried the tidings to all parts of the world. Thus had providence prepared for the way for the labors of the apostles. So through the work of John the Baptist, these people heard the message, they accepted the message, and they went through all parts of the world. And so when the apostles went to these other parts of the world, they already had people that were in the process of reformation. Only problem is that as they were listening to John the Baptist, it says in Sketches in the Life of Paul, page 129, that they had gained an imperfect knowledge of the life and mission of Christ. You see, they did not understand the purpose of Christ's mission very clearly through John the Baptist. Even John the Baptist did not clearly understand everything about the mission of Christ. Now, these disciples there in Ephesus gained a special experience on a certain way. Acts of the Apostles, page 283. It was by cherishing a humble, teachable spirit that these men gained the experience that enabled them to go out as workers in the harvest field. So these disciples in Ephesus, they were already workers. And they had gone out into the harvest field because they were cherishing a humble, teachable spirit. Their example presents to Christians a lesson of great value. There are many who make but little progress in the divine life because they are too self-sufficient to occupy the position of learners. They are content with a superficial knowledge of God's Word. They do not wish to change their faith or practice and hence make no effort 
to obtain greater light. Now when these disciples, they came and heard Paul preaching to them, and they heard about the message of Jesus, that Jesus fulfilled these things, it is very interesting what it says here, what did they do as a result? Acts chapter 19 verse 5. Acts 19 verse 5. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now wait a minute. They were already baptized. They were baptized by John the Baptist. Why were they baptized again? Did they apostatize since their baptism? No. There was no record of that. They were workers. They were disciples when Paul met them. So now let's stop and think a little bit here. John the Baptist, was he a man of God? Yes, he was. Was he instructed by God to do the baptizing? Yes, he was. He was actually a prophet. And Jesus calls him the greatest of the prophets. And so therefore, this greatest of the prophets baptized them. Did he baptize them in the right church? Well, the Jewish church was the church of God at the time. He baptized them into the church. They were Sabbath-keeping people. And now, when Paul came, they were baptized again. Why were they baptized again? Let us take a look in Acts of the Apostles, page 285. There is still another lesson for us in the experience of those Jewish converts. When they received baptism at the hand of John, they did not fully comprehend the mission of Jesus as the sinner sin bearer. They did not fully comprehend the purpose of Jesus. They were holding serious errors. What serious errors were they holding? Well, it's quite simple. The serious errors that they were holding was simply that Jesus was supposed to come and conquer the Romans. They had misplaced the prophecies. Instead of putting the second coming over here and the first coming here, they had no room in their prophecies for the first coming of Christ. They only thought that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Christ was going to come there and establish an earthly kingdom, an earthly empire. They had lost sight of the first coming of Christ. Here it's called a serious error. They were holding serious errors. But with clearer light, they gladly accepted Christ as their Redeemer. And with this step of advance came a change in their obligations. Notice here, when they took this step, there was a change in the obligations of their life. As they received a purer faith, there was a corresponding change in life. So what happens? When they received a faith that was purer, their life was changed. In token of this change, and as an acknowledgement of their faith in Christ, they were rebaptized in the name of Jesus. What happens? There was, in token of that change, because the clear light they received, that light changed their experience. In Sketches in the Life of Paul, page 132, it says, there was a corresponding change in their life and character. So their life and character was changed. And as a result of that change, they were rebaptized. Why is it important for us to hold pure doctrine? We are now coming nearly to the end of our video series. And as we are coming to this very end, you have heard many different doctrines. Maybe some of these doctrines are new for you. Why is it important for us to hold pure doctrine? Great Controversy, page 597. I will read a few of these points that we are reviewing that we have covered already in some of the other messages in the past. But here I want to emphasize it as we are coming to the end. Great Controversy, page 597. The truth and the glory of God are inseparable. It is impossible for us, with the Bible within our reach, to honor God by erroneous opinions. If we have wrong conclusions, we are not honoring God by holding those conclusions. Many claim that it matters not what one believes if his life is only right. But the life is molded by the faith. Your life, my life, 
is molded based upon the things that I believe in. In Great Controversy, page 46, after talking about the reasons for separation in the early Christian church, it says, Well would it be for the church in the world if the principles that actuated those steadfast souls were revived in the hearts of God's professed people. There is an alarming indifference in regard to the doctrines which are the pillars of the Christian faith. The opinion is gaining ground that after all, these are not of vital importance. This degeneracy is strengthening the hands of the agents of Satan so that false theories and fatal delusions which the faithful in ages past imperil their lives to resist and expose are now regarded with favor by thousands who claim to be followers of Christ. It is only helping the agents of Satan when we feel that doctrine does not matter. Doctrine does matter. In these people, in the days of Apostle Paul when he went to Ephesus, when they heard pure doctrine, they saw it was so valuable that they were rebaptized. It was this character of the early Christian church, their faithful adherence to doctrine and living it in their life that made the impression. In Great Controversy, page 46, it says, The early Christians were indeed a peculiar people. Their blameless deportment and unswerving faith were a continual reproof to disturb the sinner's peace. Though few in numbers, without wealth, position, or honorary titles, they were a terror to evildoers wherever their characters and doctrines were known. Their doctrine had an effect on their life. It changed them, and as their doctrines changed their life, their character was different, and when their character was different, they were a terror to the evildoers all around them. Do we want power to move the world? Do we want to have that experience of the latter rain today to finish the work of God on this earth? Christ Object Lessons, page 340. Christ Object Lessons, page 340. When those who profess to serve God follow Christ's example, practicing the principles of the law in their daily life, when every act bears witness that they love God supremely and their neighbors as themselves, then will the church have power to move the world. When will the church have power to move the world? When the character of Christ, it says here, when the principles of the law is lived out in our daily life, when every act bears witness that we love God supremely and our neighbor as ourselves, then and only then will the church have power to move the world. For this reason, when we are presenting the Word of God, we must understand that doctrine is Jesus Christ. And as we see Jesus in every one of our doctrines, we will see the purity and the character of our Creator. In Testimonies of Ministers, page 118, Testimonies of Ministers 118, it says, But whatever phase of the subject is presented, uplift Jesus as the center of all hope, the root and offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. You see, Jesus Christ is the pure doctrine that we are to hold. And what happens as a clear understanding of God's Word? What does it do to us? Sketches from the life of Paul, 132 to 133. Sketches from the life of Paul, 132 to 133. Many a sincere follower of Christ has had a similar experience speaking about those converts in Ephesus. A clearer understanding of God's will places man in a new relationship to Him. You see, when we understand the will of God, when you study and understand things a little bit clearer than you have before, you are placed in a new relation together with God. New duties are revealed. I'm sure after you've been studying these, this series, you find that new duties are being revealed to you. Much which before appeared innocent or even praiseworthy is now seen to be sinful. Things which you saw, thought before, oh, there's nothing wrong with this. Now you see that this is nothing else but a sin. You see it in its real sinful character. The apostle states that though he had, as he supposed, rendered obedience to the law of God, yet when the commandment was urged upon his conscience by the Holy Spirit, sin revived and had died. He saw himself a sinner 
and conscience concurred with a sentence of the law. You remember in some time ago we talked a little bit about the sins of ignorance. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. Acts chapter 17 verse 30 says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. You remember how we understood that when we talk about time of ignorance, we're not talking about willful ignorance. We're talking about when someone truly does not know. In Great Controversy, page 597 says, The truth and the glory of God are inseparable. It is impossible for us with the Bible within our reach to honor God by erroneous opinions. You cannot honor God by wrong conclusions, by wrong beliefs. You must understand the Word of God clearly for yourself. What did these believers do when they heard the message of truth? In Evangelism, page 372, Evangelism 372, as it talks about this experience of those people there in Ephesus, it says, the honest seeker after truth will not plead ignorance of the law as an excuse for transgression. If we're honestly seeking the truth, we're not going to say, oh, I was ignorant, I did not know. Light was within his reach. God's word is plain and Christ has bidden him search the scriptures. He reveres God's law as holy, just and good and he repents of his transgression. By faith he pleads the atoning blood of Christ and grasps the promise of pardon. His former baptism does not satisfy him now. You see, as we find more and more truth, we are not satisfied with the former baptism. And that's what it says here, his former baptism does not satisfy him now. He has seen himself a sinner condemned by the law of God. He has expressed anew a death to sin and he desires again to be buried with Christ by baptism. That he may rise to walk in newness of life. Such a course is in harmony with the example of Paul in baptizing the Jewish converts. That incident of those people there in Ephesus. That incident was recorded by the Holy Spirit as an instructive lesson for the church. It was written for us today. Why is this? You know, even in the Old Testament, even a sin of ignorance was still considered to be sin even though God winked at it. In Leviticus chapter 5 in verse 17, Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 17 says, And if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist it not, yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity. We're going to realize that even though we were in ignorance, when God revealed it to us, even though God winked at it, it still was sin. And this is why these people were not satisfied. What they did instead is they went back again into that watery grave and experienced baptism anew. Let us go back to that experience in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. There's some valuable lessons that we're going to learn in this particular chapter. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And soon after that, in verse 8, we find that Paul began his work. Whenever the Christian church went to different places, they went to a new area, there's somewhere where they began to present the truth. They did not begin to present the truth to the Gentiles. Where did they begin? Verse 8. And he went in the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. The first thing he did when he went to a city was he went to the Jewish synagogue and he began to dispute there for three months. What happened when they could no longer tolerate the light? Verse 9. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannius. So what happened? Notice here, when certain ones were hardened and did not believe, and they began to speak evil of the way, it was no longer time to remain in that synagogue. It was not to say, oh, let's stay here longer, maybe we'll change a few more people. Oh, no. 
when the leadership there began to speak against the truth, it says here, Paul separated the disciples and went somewhere else to teach the Word of God. Paul never remained where he was not welcomed. We mentioned earlier the importance of Ephesus being the capital city, but there are some other things about it as well. In Acts of the Apostles, page 286, it says, Ephesus was not only the most magnificent, but was the most corrupt of the cities of Asia. It was the most corrupt city in that area. Sketches on the life of Paul, 134 and 135, it talks about something special that attracted everyone in Ephesus. It says, the city was famed for the worship of the goddess Diana and the practice of magic. Here was the great temple of Diana, which was regarded by the ancients as one of the wonders of the world. Its vast extent and surpassing magnificence made it the pride not only of the city, but of the nation. Kings and princes had enriched it by their donations. The Ephesians vied with one another in adding to its splendor, and it was made the treasure house for a large share of the wealth of Western Asia. The idol enshrined in that sumptuous edifice was a rude, uncouth image, declared by tradition to have fallen from the sky. Upon it were inscribed mystic characters and symbols which were believed to possess great power. When pronounced, they were said to accomplish wonders. When written, they were treasured as a potent charm to guard their possessors from robbers, from disease, and even from death. Numerous and costly books were written by the Ephesians to explain the meaning and use of these symbols. So here in Ephesus, there was this rude, uncouth image that had a whole bunch of markings on it, a whole bunch of symbols, and they considered these symbols of very importance. It says here these mystic characters were believed that those characters themselves possessed power. When pronounced, they were supposed to accomplish wonders. So you were supposed to make sure that you pronounce those words properly in order to have wonders. When written down, they were treasured as potent charms to guard their possessors from robbers, from disease, and from death. And so they wrote many books about these, the meaning and how to use these particular symbols. And so now the power of God was revealed in the work. And certain Jews, they claimed that they also had the same power. Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 17. Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 17. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. You see, they were so deceived. They were so much living there in Ephesus that they got to believe that pronouncing words was the way things are supposed to be done. And so it is right here. The, they thought the same thing. Oh, if we could only pronounce the name of Jesus. The correct pronunciation is going to give us power. And so they went ahead and they pronounced the words just correctly. They pronounced it just like Paul did. They came there and they did something. Let's look at it. Verse 14, And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and the chief of the priest, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of Jesus was magnified. So the G name of Jesus was magnified. Why? Because you do not use the name of Jesus carelessly. You do not use it like you use that for the goddess Diana. And what happened as a result when the name of Jesus was brought to such reverence? Let us look at verses 18 through 20. Verse 18, and many of them that believed came. Now notice here, many of them that what? Not many that, not, did not say many now believed. It says many of them that believed. In other words, these were believers. And what did these believers do? It says they confessed and showed their deeds. So in the church, so Paul found certain disciples there preached for three months, some people accepted the truth, and then at this particular occasion, as the truth was growing in the city of Ephesus, we find that some of those believers now had to confess their deeds. And what did they confess? Many of them also which used curious arts, 
brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. What was going on in Ephesus? Acts of the Apostles, page 288. Acts of the Apostles, page 288. Facts which had previously been concealed were now brought to light. In accepting Christianity, some of the believers had not fully renounced their superstitions. To some extent, they still continued the practice of magic. Who was doing this? Who was practicing magic? It was right in the church. It was not in the Jewish church there. It was inside the early Christian church as it was being established in Ephesus. There was a people there. They now confessed their deeds because they had not fully renounced their superstitions. To some extent, they still continue the practice of magic. Now convinced of their error, many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Even to some of the sorcerers themselves, the good work extended, and many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found that 50,000 pieces of silver. You see, what happened was that they were convinced now that there is nothing in common with the practice of magic and Christianity. On page 137 of Sketches from the Life of Paul, what did they do? It says not only were they convinced, but what else did they do? It says, convinced of their error by the events which had recently occurred, they came and made a full confession to Paul and publicly acknowledged their secret arts to be deceptive and satanic. You see, they had deceived Paul. And so because they deceived Paul and they were, became Christians because of Paul, they now had a responsibility to confess what they had done before Paul. What did this show by burning up these books? They burned all these books. And I tell you, take a look at that. And I do believe as I evaluated the cost of this, you can hire about 20 workers for 10 years with the cost of this amount of money that was burnt up in those books. Now, why did they burn these books? Acts of the Apostles, 288 and 289. Acts of the Apostles, page 288 and 289. It says, by burning their books on magic, the Ephesian converts showed that the things in which they had once delighted, they now abhorred. It was by and through magic that they had especially offended God and imperiled their souls. And it was against magic that they showed such indignation. Thus they gave evidence of true conversion. You see, they realized that this is what they now hate. They used to be involved in magic. They must now show their hatred for it. These treaties on divination contained rules and forms of communication with evil spirits. They were the regulations of the worship of Satan, directions for soliciting his help and obtaining information from him. By retaining these books, the disciples would have exposed themselves to temptation. By selling them, they would have placed temptation in the way of others. So what was happening here? If they kept the books, they would expose themselves to temptation. If they sold them, they tempted someone else. They had renounced the kingdom of darkness, and to destroy its power, they did not hesitate at any sacrifice. Thus, truth triumphed over men's prejudices and their love of money. And the question that I have for us is, have we burned our magical books? Are you practicing magic? Is there magic in the church today? You may think, well, we're not worshiping evil spirits. Well, there are different types of magic. Most of us are familiar with the seances and sorcery, the fortune tellers, and all these different type of things that are going on today. Palm readers and all of that. Maybe we don't go into that. Maybe we don't go into neuro-linguistic programming and all sorts of things like this hypnosis and who knows whatever else may be down the line. Maybe we're not involved with any of that. But are we susceptible to sorcery? Are you practicing sorcery right now? Let us take a look. There is another angle something else that the Bible also calls sorcery. But this sorcery is often more dangerous because we often do not realize that this is what it is. Let us take a look. 
Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Among the Galatians, it says they were bewitched. Bewitched means casting a spell of sorcery upon them. And why is this? It says here that they do not obey the truth. If we do not obey the truth, is that sorcery? What is truth? You are familiar with John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If we do not follow the truth, then we are not following Jesus. Because Jesus is the truth. When we speak about Jesus in volume 3, Selected Messages, page 198. Volume 3, Selected Messages, 198 says, Christ is the complete system of truth. Jesus is truth. The complete system of truth. What kind of truth? Testimonies and Ministers, page 64 to 65. Testimonies and Ministers, 64 to 65. They are not willing to exchange their own righteousness, which is unrighteousness, for the righteousness of Christ, which is pure, unadulterated truth. What is righteousness of Christ? When we talk about righteousness, have you accepted Christ's righteousness? What is it? Christ's righteousness is the acceptance of pure, unadulterated truth. If we accept anything less than pure, unadulterated truth, then we are not accepting Christ's righteousness. For this reason, in Signs of the Times, May 18, 1882, is a very important statement. Signs of the Times, May 18, 1882, says this way, Every person, who? Every person, who cherishes a known error in faith or practice is under the power of sorcery and is practicing sorcery upon others. Satan employs him to mislead other souls. This is what she wrote after she quoted Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. Let me say it again. Every person who cherishes a known error in faith or practice is under the power of sorcery and is practicing sorcery upon others. Are you cherishing a known error in faith or practice? Are you cherishing a known error in your beliefs? Are there things that you know you should be living up to and you are not? If you are, then you are practicing sorcery. That's right. No wonder people are falling in for the celebration and movement and everything else. They've already been falling under the power of sorcery by neglecting the truth. You and I are going to fall for the same things. The Pentecostal movement will become a part of us because we are not accepting truth. Do you want to accept the truth? Do you want to follow Jesus all the way? Then the truth that you've been learning about, it's high time that we make a decision, that we decide to follow the Lord with all our heart. Right now is a time for us to evaluate our whole experience. It is not enough to know only a little bit. It is not enough to only know these things. It is high time that we make a full commitment to Jesus as our Lord and personal Savior. The article continues. If we would indeed become children of God, we must renounce at once and forever every sinful indulgence. We must close every avenue through which Satan may gain control of our thoughts and affections. Many persons manifest determined hatred of some sins denouncing the Word of God, while they at the same time indulge their favorite sin. Not so did the Ephesian converts. Their particular sin was magic. By this means, Satan held them in his power. They might have been earnest and vigilant to correct other evils. But had they spared this one sin, they would have ere long yielded the faith. If there are things that you know about right now, if there are truths that you know about, and if you're not choosing to live up to those truths, you will eventually give up the faith. We look at the future, we think of the Sunday laws, we think of all these things, we sometimes get terrified of the future. 
Well, brothers and sisters and friends, unless we make a decision today to renounce every evil that we know about, we will be one of them. We will fall at that time. If we are not able to overcome the small things today, how are we going to be able to stand at that time? We cannot then. Had they spared this one sin, they would ere long have yielded their faith. But they laid an axe to the root of the tree. They renounced the hidden things of darkness and destroyed that which led them into sin. Next paragraph. This incident was placed on record as an important lesson for every age. The Ephesians directed their efforts against the very sins of which they were guilty. Have the people of God in this age acted in like manner? There are many who manifest supreme devotion to their money, their business, or their homes and lands. The ambitious man worships fame or honor as his idol. The covetous man fosters covetousness. The sensualist is wedded to his lust. These love their cherished objects of pursuit more than they love God. They are idolaters. Next paragraph. Those who venture to cherish the sin which they love best are tampering with Satan's sorcery. If you are cherishing the sin that you love best, you are playing around with Satan's sorcery. We call it nothing else. Let's not gloss it over with any other nice terms. It is witchcraft. That's what it is. Are we practicing witchcraft in the church today? The early Christian church had it right there, and they could not have success until they rooted out this thing. It says in Acts chapter 19, verse 20, after they burned up their books, it says, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Do you want to see the word of God prevail? Do you want to see the gospel go to the ends of the earth? Well, it's time for us as a people to give up everything that we know is to be sin. Give up that sorcery. Give up that witchcraft and stand fully and 100% in the way of God. The enchanting power of temptation had paralyzed conscience and blinded reason so that they do not perceive their danger. The magical books have not been destroyed. And going on, next few paragraphs. When the truth presented to the understanding exerts its sanctifying power upon the heart, the sins which were once cherished will be put away that Jesus may occupy the soul temple. If covetousness has been indulged, it will be given up. If the love of the world has captivated the senses, a higher attraction will break its power. Deceit, falsehood, impurity will be cleansed from the heart. He who maintains his allegiance to Christ can render no service to Christ's bitterest foes. Many place themselves on enchanted ground. What is enchanted ground? Enchanted ground is a ground over which there is a spell and you come upon that ground. That is called enchanted ground. That is a place where we're asking Satan, please come and tempt me. Do you think it takes him much? No, it doesn't. And what is this enchanted ground? What type of, what is, where are those places where fallen spirits love to congregate? You know where it is? Many place themselves on enchanted ground by frequenting scenes of amusement where fallen spirits congregate. Where do fallen spirits congregate? Upon frequenting scenes of amusement. We have all these amusement parks. For what purpose? It is there that fallen spirits congregate. I remember one time as a child I had gone to a place, I think it's in Santa or somewhere down there, I can't remember exactly, just south of San Francisco, we went there as a school. And I remember there was this one particular ride, and we had to sit there in this hot sun for one hour to be able to get onto this ride. And we got on there finally, and this ride went all the way up like this, and we were up going up backwards like this, and all of a sudden it dropped down, went up and back down, and that was it. And we got out of the out of this little ride, as I got out of it, I was shocked. You know what all the people did on air? They ran to the back of the line. I said, you got to be joking. This is what they are doing. Imagine suffering there for one hour in that blistering heat just to have that 60-second ride. How many of us would stand one hour in blistering heat 
just to hear the Word of God. How many of us would be willing to do that? We say that's torture. God, no one should expect us to do that. And yet for that little lousy 60 seconds, we're going to waste all that time. You see, we are taken under the control of another spirit. Many place themselves on enchanted ground by frequenting scenes of amusement where fallen spirits congregate. Professing Christian, when you resort to the theater, remember that Satan is there conducting the play as the master actor. Today we don't have to go to a theater. We have it in our home. It's called television set or videos. And what do we have there? It has all these acts that are going on and they keep forgetting to put down the master actor, Satan himself. He is there to excite passion and glorify vice. The very atmosphere is permeated with licentiousness. Satan presides also at the masquerade and at the dance. He throws around the card table its bewitching power. Wherever an influence is exerted to cause men to forget their creator, there Satan is at work. It matters not how innocent the guise under which he conceals his purpose. We can add also the popular music to this whole list as well. Many who cannot be attracted by the allurements of pleasure are ensnared by the teachings of science falsely so called. They are led to extol human reason above divine revelation to exalt nature and forget the God of nature. Is there no magic, no sorcery going on around us? The question for us today really is, have the disciples of Christ burned the magical books? Have we burned our magical books? Have they made a decided change in their principles and habits of life? Have they separated themselves from the enchantment of the world? Those who knowing their danger will yet venture into places of worldly demoralizing amusement or will poison the mind with the literary productions of the skeptic or the sensualist are guilty of presumption. God does not give His angels charge to keep those who choose to walk in forbidden paths. The question for each one of us is have we burned those magical books? Let me repeat that statement once again from Signs of the Times, May 18, 1882. Every person who cherishes unknown error in faith or in practice is under the power of sorcery and is practicing sorcery upon others. As we've been listening to this whole video series and we have now come to the last tape and the second to the last study of the series, the question for you, is have you burned those magical books? It says, O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Now is our time. Now is our day of opportunity. God is calling each and every one of us to decide to fully live up to all the truth that we have known. Now the decision is not just to decide to live up to it, but the decision is to give our heart fully to the Lord, that He may live that truth in us. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Now is our day of opportunity. Now is our time to give everything on the altar of sacrifice. My question for you is, are you prepared to burn the magical books and give everything for the life of Jesus?